Alrighty, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael and I'm a third year PhD student who is also affiliated with the Metal Earth Research Group at Laval University. And as you can see from the rather long working title of my PhD project, which is largely supervised by Professor Laflamme and Professor Boudouin, uh, this project is more focused on the sink side of things, as opposed to the um, search side of things, which we've already covered in great detail. And there are essentially two major components detrimental to this project. Um, the first one is trying to better characterize the timing and the longevity through in-situ geochronology of um, accessory phases in equilibrium with arch and gold mineralization. And the second one tries to better understand particularly sulfur sources as well as associated trace element signatures of sulfate minerals and therefore trying to better characterize uh, gold mineralization processes at the mineral grain scale. First of all, however, I'd like to take the chance over here and also give a great and big thanks to all of our partners, particularly in the industry of which, as you can see, there are a lot over here, as well as in academia. So thank you for all your um, effort and all the research and all the different result acquisition that has gone into this project so far. Um, so what, I'm, what are we going to look at over the next couple of minutes? So there are essentially three major topics I want to cover. Well, two large one and a quick summary. So we'll take a look at all of our in-situ geochronology results that we were able to acquire so far. And then we'll shift gears and uh, have a first look at some preliminary multiple sulfur isotope data that we were able to acquire in situ at the University of Western Australia on the SIMS over there, as well as in situ sulfur trace element signatures of associated um, sulfate minerals with gold mineralization at the at UCAC University in Chikudi. Okay, let me try and set the scene first for the in-situ geochronology part of this presentation. And I wanna do that by taking all of us to the continent of Australia, more specifically the Western part of Australia, which we've already seen today, where we do have our key and yellow grain craton exposed. And I wanna focus over here in this slide on the two north to south trending Kalgoorlie and Kurnal Gindalbi terrains, as you can see on your right-hand side, because along the amalgamated border, we observe a lot of um, particularly orogenic gold mineralization associated with uh, steep brittle to duct by shear zones. And when you look to your left hand side over here, we can see the um, geological timeline of both of these terrains in the sense that we have our greenstone architecture first starting out by um, volcanic um, units from the first, which are then later intruded by intruding dome complexes of um, different uh, geochemical compositions from ultramafic, mafic, and felsic rocks. And both of these units are then later on um, uh, covered by sedimentary rocks. And all of these rocks find themselves, in this case, within the um, a deformational period or several deformational periods attributed to the Kalgoorlie orogenic cycle. And what Noreen, Phil Riker, and others were able to find out through in situ monocyte and xenotheme geochronology is that most of the gold that's associated with these steep riddle to duct shear zones is constrained to a rather narrow period of time when it comes, uh, when it plots on the geological timeline. And that puts it there for um, post, at post peak metamorphic conditions along the retrograde path of the Kalgoorlie orogenic cycle. That's when we form most of our steep brittle to duct shear zones and also introduce most of our gold in the area. By analogy, I'd like to take us back now to the southeastern part of the Superior Craton, more specifically to the area of the Abitibi subprovince um, and the Pontiac subprovince. So in the area of Malartic and Valdor, we do have the dividing structure, which we all know are east-west trending, largely larger than the Cadillac fault zone that divides the volcano sedimentary rocks and intrusive dome complexes of the Abitibi subprovince that were metamorphosed to a um, green schist metamorphic grade from our meta sedimentary rocks of the Pontiac subprovince, particularly at the interface between the Malartic and Valdor area. And these meta sedimentary rocks, as you've just previously seen, are largely composed of um, gray wackies in the area that we're looking at of upper ranges to amphibolite metamorphic grade. And we're going to zoom in into the Malartic and Paldor area where we find a large number of um, known gold deposits that are historically and currently mined. Before we go into the lithologic, to the geological setting of the area, I'd like to um, take a look at a simplified timeline just um, more specifically at the different deformational periods that we observe because um, gold mineralization within the Malartic and Valdor area largely is in relationship to a deformational north to south shortening event. And that north to south shortening event forms a predominant 
east-west trending subvertical schistosity in the area. And that is related to this D2 for, um, event over here. So we got north to south shortening during D2, forming a, a predominant east-west trending subvertical schistosity. And in relation to this D2 event, we have earlier quartz carbonate veins that from prior to the shortening event, and they're therefore highly deformed, booty nushed, and then trained with our, in our D2 event. And then towards the tail end of our D2 event, we have um, fabric cross-cutting quartz tourmaline carbonate veins that are introduced in the area and contain most of our orogenic gold mineralization. And they're by analogy form along the retrograde path of the Abitibi Wawa orogeny. And what I want you to take away from this slide is that people have tried to date um, gold mineralization in the area. So these are individual dates and analyses that were taken from either vein material or vein alteration halos. And as you can see, people have tried to apply different isotopic systems in different um, accessory minerals in datable phases. And as you can see, they rather plot um, scattered clouds throughout the timeline over here, and they span a total period of roughly 350 million years so far. And that's what we're hoping to better characterize and identify with our in-situ geochronology. So let's just dive into the geological setting of the Malartic and Waldori area. So as you can see in the upper part of the map over here are more colorful units, um, are part of the Abitibi sub-province. And we see um, an overall east-west trend. So all of these colorful units more or less describe um, volcanic units of the Abitibi sub-province with an east-west trend and the steep volcanic bedding um, inclined steeply dipping to the north. Um, you see a fold hinge over here in the northern part that um, is responsible for the steep dip to the north. And then we see there for a younging sequence to the south towards the Pontic subprovince shown over here, largely in blue, with the dividing structure, the Lada Lake Cadillac Faults and Hash Gray area over here. Um, most of the volcanic units from in between 2715 to 2700 million years, with then our large dome complexes intruding over here, primarily the Burlamuk Batholith and the Presic Lacorn, as well as East Sullivan stocks. Geology and the structural traces are a little easier to understand when we look at a cross-section roughly going through here, in the sense that we have, as we've already touched on in the north, our largely east-west trend being Lamotte fold hinge that's responsible for the east-west trend of our volcanic units. Therefore, the bedding is roughly parallel to the fold hinge. Also means that we have our oldest rocks exposed um, in the northern part of the camp, largely composed of ultramafic rocks, such as comadias, for example. And then we see a young trend going over into Medep Mafic to even Felsic rocks um, into the Pontic subprovince in the south. Uh, we don't see any traces that relate to a large scale folding and tilting event that formed the Lamotte fold hinge. So there's no S1 that's um, exposed in the area, but we see ample evidence of this S2. And again, this S2 is derived from a north to south shortening event and therefore roughly striking east west subvertically to steeply dipping to the north and superimposed onto our volcanic bedding. And then towards the tail end of our D2 deformational period, we have the introduction of the steep brittle to duct shear zones, which have um, which are deeply uh, steeply dipping, so forming steep and flat structures, which we know as our quartz tourmaline carbonate veins in the area, and also contain most of the gold in the area. And along these quartz tourmaline carbonate veins, we see a dexter reactivation causing caused by a rotation from north to south shortening towards more northeast to southwest shortening. Alrighty, these are the different ore bodies that we were fortunate enough to get samples of. As you can see, there are um, four different mineralization styles. I just want to emphasize that most of the gold in the area is contained within our quartz carbonate main set, as well as quartz tourmaline carbonate main set. There are early traces of gold mineralization that are associated with more sin volcanic processes in the area of Akasaba West in proximity to the Pontiac and Lerder Lake Cadillac Fault zone. And then we also have sub PPM levels of gold contained within the area of Malartic and so called um, disseminated stock works, which are sub parallel to our S2 foliation in the area. And then, by, by and large, we have our quartz tourmaline carbonate veins that comprise several ore bodies throughout the area of Waldor, as you can see over here. What we were able to successfully date were the quartz carbonate main set and the quartz tourmaline carbonate main set, as we'll see in a minute. But before we get into the uranium, let geochronology results I'd like to take us through some of the core uh, samples just to give an idea of what we're dealing with and what the different mineralization stuff look like. Starting out chronologically with our oldest traces of gold mineralization, um, 
we do see that we have an interesting magnetic calcopyrite pressure that's contained within felsic volcanic clastic rocks of the Eva Formation, proximal to the Pontiac Star Province. And we know that gold is contained within our calcopyrite of up to 2 ppm over here um, in two gold copper lenses. And those gold copper lenses are um, strongly entrained within our S2 foliation, as you can see over here. And we also find traces of cross-cutting quartz thermally carbonate veins throughout the cores. Moving on to our next younger gold mineralization style, quartz carbonate veins, um, most dominantly in the area around Kigena within the S50 ore body, where we see strongly chloritized basalt that hosts by and large quartz carbonate breccia, as well as strongly foliated quartz carbonate veins over here that are also entrained within our S2 regional foliation again. And these quartz carbonate breccia and veins host a pyrotype pyrite calcopyrite gold assemblage of up to 7 ppm of gold. Moving on to the area of around Malartic, where we find our uh, SIMD2 disseminated stockwork in the form of quartz carbonate biotype pyrite veins, where we have gold contained within pyrite of up to 1 ppm, so really low levels of gold, but a high large tonnage for everybody who's been there that knows what I'm talking about because uh, there's a huge mine over there, uh, Canadian Malaptic, namely. And we know this is, um, this stock work is more or less subparallel to our S2 foliation in the air, not only within Meta intrusive and Meta volcanic rocks, but also in Meta sedimentary rocks of the Pontiac sub province over here, as you can see. And last but not least, uh, we have our quartz thermal carbonate main sets by the example of the triangle deposit. But we are at an underground stop over here. We're facing to the west. I've schematically indicated there as two regional foliation over here, um, facing to the west. Therefore, it's coming directly at us. And we, and we can see that our quartz thermal and carbonate vein is clearly cross cutting our regional foliation in the area over here. Uh, therefore, forming late D2. Um, this quartz thermal and carbonate weaver shear holds gold within the form of pyrite and calcopyrite assemblages for the most part up to 7 ppm of gold. Alrighty, um, I really just want to give you a brief overview of our geochronology results. So what we were able to do is, um, first of all, what are we looking at over here? We're looking at three different upper intercepts. And these comprise 85 CEMA teams that we were able to successfully date out of a total of over 340 monocytes and CEMA times that we've dated. But we were only able to really successfully date 85 CEMA teams with uh, Jeff on the laser at Laurent Laurent University. And as you can see, we were able for Kiena to date 19 different spots in 11 Xeno teams that give us an upper intercept of 2686 million years. Um, and then within our quartz thermal and carbonate means that we were able to differentiate between at least two different Xeno team populations. The first one, um, which we know is in textural equilibrium with auriferous sulfate minerals as well as sulfate mineral inclusions, um, gives us an upper intercept at 2643 million years and also yields elevated rare earth element concentrations, as opposed to a different set, another set of Xeno team, which is in textual disequilibrium with uh, auriferous sulfate minerals in the sense that these Xeno teams really overgrow and replace auriferous sulfate minerals and give us an upper intercept at 26 or 7 million years and also contain depleted rare earth element concentrations. And why I'm saying this, um, just this briefly, is because we'll be doing a talk for Quebec Min, where we'll take a deep dive into the in-situ uranium that geochronology of our project. And what I want to leave you with for the geochronology part is just a quick summary of what we were able to pull apart. So when we come back to our timeline over here, we can see that we have different scattered um, clouds of our different isotopic systems applied in different accessory minerals. And what's interesting to see over here is that these somewhat show a decrease, a subsequent decrease in the closure temperature. And we therefore think that the bulk uh, geochronology that's been published for the area could rather represent a cooling signal. Um, as we show over here that we have three distinct uh, hydrothermal periods that we've outlined with our in-situ uranium lead geochronology. Um, for the last couple of minutes, I just want to touch on some preliminary multiple sulfur isotope data that we've just gotten back from Perth. And I just want to give a brief overview of, of why are we actually doing multiple sulfur isotope analyses. So because we know that within specific um, environments, we know that 
sulfur and, and due to specific photochemical reactions um, in a reduced atmosphere, that's what we know so far, is we know that sulfur can um, behave, can fractionate in a different way and imprint um, a so-called signature caused by mass independent fractionation that can be traced throughout an orogenic cycle. And that mass independent fractionation signature is by and large um, revealed when we look at our CAP33 sulfur and CAP36 sulfur signatures in sulfate minerals. Because it turns out that also with the recent advent and um, improvements in, in situ analytical techniques that delta 34 sulfur values can be more indicative of local physical chemical reactions within hydrothermal fluids and also host rock interactions. And we're hoping that we can use these three values in combination with trace element signatures of representative sulfate minerals to better trying to characterize and get a better idea of our sulfur that's associated with the system. Because we know that sulfur, particularly associated with arginic gold mineralization, is the most important transporting ligand for gold. And therefore also get a better understanding of gold precipitation mechanisms. So what I want to do over here is just show a couple of examples of what sulfate minerals we are encounter in our mineralization style. So we have our volcanic uh, magnetite calcopyrite fracture with gold contained in, in calcopyrite for the most part. We then have our gold within the quartz carbonate veins that associated at the interface between pyrite and pyrotite are also replacing magnetite ferroblast as you can see over here. Within our disseminated stock work we find minute inclusions of gold as well as base metal inclusions within um, faintly sewn pyrite as seen over here. And within our late D2 quartz thermal carbonate veins that we commonly observe a porous core domain as well as an, a neat rim domain where we can see gold inclusions within the core as well as within the rim domain, but also commonly see zinc domains within our pirates and base metal inclusions, namely calcopyrite, pirates, phthalate, and galena. And we'll go through the in situ multiple sulfur isotope data real quick chronologically plotted on a delta 34 versus cap 33 sulfur chart. And we'll start with our symbol volcanic reaction again. Over here, as you can see, we have a negative delta 34 signature with more or less evenly distributed to positive negative cap 33 space. Moving on to the next younger mineralization style, namely quartz carbonate veins, we see a widespread from uh, from negative to positive delta 34 values with a slightly negative cap 33 sulfur signature. The SYNV2 disseminated stock work similar to our quartz carbonate means also a strong spread from negative to positive values and a slightly positive cap 33 signature. And last but not least, our quartz thermal carbonate veins to show a positive delta 34 signature throughout as well as a slightly negative cap 33 signature throughout. Um, and what I want you to take away from this slide is that with most likely the exception of our Akasaba West samples, the same volcanic fracture, we do see a mass independent fractionation um, signal that's preserved within sulfur that we still have to better investigate and take a deeper look at. And for the last minute, I'd like to focus on the quartz thermal carbonate main set and just show you what we're trying to better characterize. So in other words, we're trying to look at the sulfate formation environment. In the sense, as you can see here, we got our pyrite that's from a quartz sericide albite alteration halo of the quartz thermal carbonate vein with a porous core domain and a nice rim domain. And then we're just trying to better characterize the different trace elements that are associated with our pyrites. This is only preliminary data, and we still are acquiring more data on this end over here but I just want you to know that they are really low levels below 3000 ppm, like at least these couple of minor, um, elements that we were able to pull apart, which throws up the last question of how is gold actually hosted? Because we know that orogenic gold mineralization commonly hosts gold associated with arsenic. And what we're looking at over here are just individual line analyses of individual pirates at different lengths taken on the laser. We can see that arsenic and gold don't seem to be um, related at all. In contrast, gold and silver seem to be more associated with tellurium and bismuth, which seems to be um, also a, a contrast to the yellow and craton largely where we observe a lot of arsenic and gold going together. It's also evident when we look at the mineral grain scale where we have a porous core domain, and then our gold, silver, tellurium, bismuth inclusions hosted in rim domains, as well as late stage gold in younger sulfate fractures of the soft grain boundaries, for example. So last but not least, I want to leave you with this, that we do see multiple short-lived hydrothermal events that we could not only pull out by in situ geochronology, but also in sulfur isotopic compositions of different gold mineralization styles. 
We also observe different trends within our multiple sulfur isotope and trace element signatures in individual mineralization styles. And last but not least, we want to take a closer look at our gold, silver, tellurium, bismuth inclusions to better try and understand what causes gold mineralization. And we want to do that through transmission electromicroscopy next year. So that's pretty much all I got. Thank you very much. Stay tuned.